My name is Shane Fisher. Welcome to Is There Any Word from the Lord? And, and I'm David Fanning, and I'm an evangelist as well as Shane here with the Churches of Christ, and also I'm a promoter of thegospelofchrist.com. And we're glad that you've joined us for these series of videos, and we're basically doing a new series on talking about, basically, if you're a new Christian, if you're a member of the One True Church, we want to help prepare you in your community and how to go about helping to grow the Lord's church in your area. Because you remember John 8, 31 and 32 talks about that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And we're so glad that the truth has set you free. And we know that you want others to know the truth so that they can be set free from sin. And so we're designing these videos for preparation. And so what we want to get into first is talking about the mission of the Lord's church. As you know, uh, you know, when we go out into the world, actually, businesses have a mission statement. Well, even the Lord's Church has a mission statement. And that same mission has been going on for the past 2,000 years. And we see this incorporated in various scriptures that we're going to be speaking about and the principle that lies behind them. And, of course, we talk about so, such as uh, we find in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And... Uh, Dave, if you want to get Mark 16, 15, and 16, we'll read that too. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so we see a principle there, a principle that we're to go into the world so that others can hear the gospel, so that they can obey the gospel and be saved from their sins. And so that is what our, our same mission is, is that is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're to make disciples, we're to duplicate ourselves, and we're to basically make others be able to teach others and to teach others and to teach others. And that's what we're going about doing. David, you want to add anything to this? Absolutely. Just like Shane stated, we are actually, what we're doing is we are helping you begin the congregation of the Lord's Church. As we know, it's, it started in the day of Pentecost, so church has already been built, but as far as planting the seed of the New Testament church in your community, perhaps you don't have that in your community. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, you can actually help to start the Lord's Church and between Shane and I, we've actually helped to start three congregations, so we're going to share with you some of the information that we have to be able to be more practical and helpful to you. Now, as Shane was reading from Matthew chapter 28, that great commission is given to all disciples from the time that it was first mentioned all the way up until the end of the world or the age, so that applies to us as well. So what God is telling us is that if we know how to become a disciple, then we know how to make a disciple. Now, whether you're really good at it or not so good at it, Please don't let that be the issue because we all, if we know how to become a disciple, know how to make a disciple. I know when I first began to teach a lot of my school peers when I was 15 years old, I had no idea, I thought at least, I had no idea what I was doing. But yet I was opening the Word of God and showing what the Bible had to say and over 20 various people obeyed the gospel while I was in high school. And that was because I pretty much didn't know what I was doing, but I trusted in the power of the gospel according to Romans 1.16. So what we're doing is we're trying to first give you the idea that, hey, you know what? There's not a new, true New Testament church in my community, and I want to get this started. So how do I do this? And this is what we especially want to do. So first you need to realize that, that there is a mission. That mission is that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we're to continue to do this until the end of the age. Now let's go to Mark 16, verses 15 to 16, and then you'll get Luke chapter 24 after that, Shane. And here's what is stated by Mark as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to also record the Great Commission. It says, He said to them, that is, Jesus said to the eleven apostles and others that were around, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Shane, I mean, most people, what is the start of their world? I mean, it's basically where they live, right? Yeah. So wherever you are, I, when I started, I was in my high school. It was a secular high school, and those are the folks that I were around, and I was the light within that uh, area and so I just started shining the light, opening the gospel up, and started sharing the gospel. So when it talks about going to all the world, you start with your community. When you look at the Book of Acts, for instance, 
talks about going from Jerusalem to Judea, which is the province that also contains Jerusalem, Samaria, which is the next door neighbor providence, if you will, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So you start at home. You start at home. So it, it says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Don't, don't assume by saying, well, I don't think that person will be receptive. I don't think that person will hear what I have to say or what the Bible has to say. The fact of the matter is, do not presume that because think for this just a moment here. In Acts chapter 9, we have the story of Saul of Tarsus. He was the number one enemy of the church of Christ. And yet, we learn from Acts chapter 9 that the gospel changed him into one of the greatest personal evangelists that the church has ever seen. And so, don't ever assume that. Don't ever assume. Know that everybody's a candidate for salvation because Jesus died for all. And at the same time, do not assume a person's not going to be receptive. Now, in verse 16, he tells us what we're to preach. There are the classification of the saved, he who believes and is baptized, and the classification of the lost, that is, those who do not believe. If you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. You're not going to be baptized for the right reason. You're already condemned. But if you go by what the gospel teaches, that Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected from the dead, then you're going to be baptized for the remission of sins. And we'll have more to say about that in just a moment. So here's another verse that tells we as the church that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So regardless of what country you're in, regardless of what community you're in, you can help start the church, or more accurately, you can help to plant and grow the church that we read about in the New Testament. I was thinking about Acts 16, you know, where you're talking about starting your home. Well, who do we have starting in, that, in Philippi? We find Lydia in her household, and we find the Philippian jailer in his household. Right. And so they help start the church yeah, in Philippi. Start in your community, start in your home, and then go from there. So in Luke 24, verse 44, the Bible says this, Then Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So as we see, this original context is given to the apostles. And we see that they would be endowed with the Holy Spirit, that we call the immersion in the Holy Spirit or baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so they were going to be able to teach the whole truth and be guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth. And we see as a case that this be, the church began in Jerusalem. And we see as a case here also that repentance and remission of sins be preached in his name. Now, remember who's writing this. This is Luke writing about the Great Commission. Now, it's very interesting when you go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and you find on the day of Pentecost the apostles are preaching the word, just as Jesus had told them to do in Mark 16, Matthew 28. And we see as a case that in, in Acts 2, Peter begins to preach to them, and they finally are convicted in their hearts that they had murdered the Messiah. They asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 37, and in verse 38, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You remember what Luke had said? Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. And that it, once you are a convicted sinner and you realize that Jesus is the Son of God, are willing to repent of your sins, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then are immersed in water so you can contact the blood of Jesus, then you become a New Testament Christian. And that's what Luke was trying to get at with regards to getting the truth out there. And I'm glad that you have obeyed the truth so that men can be set free. Is there anything you want to add to this? Absolutely. Well, just to continue with what you said in Acts 2.38 is where the final thing as to what we must do to be saved is mentioned. And then you go down to verse 41 and you see the church of Christ planted in the first century. As the Bible says in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, then those who gladly received His word, that is that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God, that you must believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and it says that, that, they, that they were baptized. They were immersed in the water. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Well, what were they added to? You know, Jesus had talked about the fact in Matthew 16, 18 to 19, that he was going to build his church. And, and also, I think it was in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, where he talked about there would be some standing here would not taste death or experience death until they see the kingdom come with power. Well, we're seeing this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, <laughs> because now about 3,000 souls are added. We'll look at verse 47. And the New King James, uh, verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
So when you share the gospel, the pure gospel, and we'll talk about what the gospel is later, but when you share the pure gospel and somebody gladly receives that word and is immersed in the water for their mission or forgiveness of their sins, that's the purpose why they're baptized, so that their sins will be cleansed through the blood of Jesus. That's the point at which it comes in contact with the blood of Jesus. The Lord Himself adds you to His church. Nobody can join the church. Uh, you can't have a, a council of people to a vote whether or not you're going to be a part of the church. You see how easy this actually is? If a person just simply follows the gospel plan of salvation and they then are baptized in Jesus Christ so that their sins will be washed away through the blood of Jesus, that the Lord adds them to the church of Christ. And now, guess what? Here you are, member of the church of Christ. You cannot find a New Testament church in your community. You are able to bring the gospel to somebody. They obey the gospel. Now the Lord adds them to you and also all members of the Lord's church throughout uh, the world. And that's what we're trying to encourage you to do. So we want to get you started with two or three or four. And you do it by planting the seed of the Word of God, and then the Lord adds you to His church. Mm -hmm. In fact, we see that it's not just to stay in Jerusalem. It's actually to go everywhere. And in Acts 8, 3 and 4, when the church was being persecuted, they were scattered everywhere. It says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the Word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And so we begin to see throughout the book of Acts this growth of the church going from city to city. We see Paul going on his missionary journeys from this place to another place. And the church is being planted and the seed of the true gospel is being planted into honest hearts and the church is growing there. So it's amazing to see that we can help people to do this. Oh, absolutely. And one thing I definitely want you to see in Acts chapter 8 verses 3 to 4 is the average member of the Jerusalem Church of Christ because of persecution was scattered into various regions and they were in places where the church had not been established yet. That's what we're talking about. And the average member of the church shared the gospel and churches began to grow and grow and grow. And that's what we're trying to encourage everybody to do with this. Yeah, every disciple. Absolutely. So let's go on to from the mission statement. So we know the mission statement. We know what we're supposed to be doing. Now we're going to show you how that's to be done. What's the method? What does God want us to do? as our King and Savior, what does He desire us? Well, we're to simply teach the one true gospel. That's it. In fact, uh, the gospel is, is figuratively spoken of as a seed. Um, and that's really amazing. We find in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, where the Bible talks about Jesus actually talking about this parable of the sower. And, and it's really interesting because when He talks about the parable of the sower, that's the parable of all parables because if you listen to this parable and understand it, then you'll really be able to catch on to, of course, all the other parables. And that's what it takes an honest and good heart because we see that the gospel, when it's preached, it's going to fall on various soils. And Jesus talked about four different types of soils. So it says in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayward side are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So as you can see here, we see that the gospel is going to be taught to various types of individuals. There are going to be those who just say, I don't care. They're indifferent. And that's going to fall by the wayside. There are going to be those who, who when the seed falls on rock, now they will receive the word for a little while, but then they just soon disappear. They just stop serving the Lord. Right, right, David? That's exactly right. And then, sadly, there are those who allow the world to come back into their lives and take them away from the church. But then there is that fourth group that we hope that you will still remain, that it's an honest and good heart, honest and good heart who shares the gospel with others, who edifies, who's edified by God to go out and teach others and to help build up the church. And so... Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up because what you got to understand is, number one, normally when you plant the seed, most people are going to reject it, at least initially, like Saul of Tarsus did. Don't mean that later <clears> on they won't accept it, but initially they will. So don't get discouraged about that because that's normally what happens. 
And then there will be those who will obey the gospel, but they're only temporary. And they're, you're like, oh, I worked so hard and finally shared the gospel. They finally obeyed the gospel and they were faithful for a while and they're not faithful anymore. That happens. You just got to understand that's part of it as well. That's what we're seeing in Luke chapter 8. But what you've got to do is continue to endure, continue to, to stay strong. Another verse I want to share is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 5. Where in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, it says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, said Paul, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now again, we're seeing the method, the method of how we're able to accomplish the mission. The method is you simply preach the gospel. You simply share the gospel. You simply teach somebody the true gospel. And when you do that, it's planted within their heart. And they've got to decide what they're going to do with that. Hopefully they repent and are baptized. But then also there may be somebody else to come along. Like in the case with Shane, he, he, he shared the gospel with somebody. They obeyed the gospel. And then I came along and started doing the watering. So in, and vice versa. So we, we team up together. We work together to try to do this. So we want to try to help you. This is the first way in which we want to try to help you by making this information available to you. The whole idea is for you to go onto the gospelofchrist.com website under study aids and look for manuals and you'll see under there how to start and grow the Church of Christ. And that's what we're talking about here. So you plant the seed, somebody else waters the seed or you water the seed, and then the Lord gives the increase when the person obeys the gospel. Yeah, and, it, and remember in Luke's par in the parable that Luke, Jesus gave in Luke, we find it says bear it with patience. It's going to take a lot of patience. Absolutely. It will take a lot of patience. It, it may take six months. It may take a year for someone to become a Christian because there's so many barriers that we're dealing with today in today's world, and we need to get out all the error in order to put in the truth. So that's something that we need to recognize. Um, so let's look at the one true gospel. And Peter and Paul points this out in Galatians 1 where we see he's writing to the Galatian brethren because they are being led away from the truth. There, there is false brethren who have come in and have introduced a new gospel. And it's not the true gospel. And in Galatians 1 verse 6 it says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you to the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Notice the repetition. Notice the strong warning Paul has here that and he wants us to recognize that there are gonna, if there's another message that even comes from an angel or even comes from an, another apostle, uh, of course, there are no living apostles today, but anyways, there are going to be those who are going to try to teach a different gospel. And we need to adhere to only what the Bible says in the New Testament on what it says that one true gospel is. Because we see that if we plant the wrong seed, then we're going to get the wrong type of fruit. That's just a simple matter. Uh, you know, we find this in Matthew chapter 15. Uh, are you there, David, or you want to read? No, go ahead. That's fine. Go ahead. All right. In Matthew 15, it's very interesting that Jesus, ha he was talking to the Pharisees in this, in this context. And you see, the Pharisees were known for, sad, uh, they, they, they did have the law of Moses, but they were stacking up their oral traditions and making them as if they were the law of God. So in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, uh, Jesus says to them, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, for their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then he, he goes on to say in verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. So you see, if you plant the wrong seed, the wrong message, you're going to get the wrong fruit. And God, on the day of judgment, he's going, to, he's going to uproot that. And He's going to judge that as being condemned. And so we urge people, uh, those of you who are true New Testament Christians, that there are so many lost people out there who, who are not hearing the truth. And we want them to know the truth by going to what the Bible teaches. And, uh, if you, and we're going to give some examples. And this is going to... Uh, gonna make some people mad, but you know what? We don't mind offend, offending people, because if you plant the seed of Hinduism, that's a which is a false religion. Well, that, friend, they're not in Jesus Christ. 
They have not obeyed the truth. How about Buddhism? If you plant the seed of Buddhism in someone's heart, well, that's still the wrong type of fruit that's going to be developed. If you plant uh, Islam or Mormonism, but here's where it hits really close to home. And th this is where the devil is very tricky. He wants those who think they are followers of Jesus, who are in denominations, to think that they are okay, that they are all right. But in fact, it is the denominations who are following the doctrines and commandments of men instead of the doctrine of God. And sadly, they will be uprooted because they're not following the one true gospel. Is there something you want to add? Yeah, absolutely. Just to pretty much emphasize what you've already stated. When you're talking about a planting of a seed, if you don't plant the seed of the gospel, the one true gospel, you, you, you plant like you stated before the doctrine of Buddha, then you produce a Buddhist, Islam, you produce a, a Muslim. And according to John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice he didn't say, except maybe Buddha or maybe, you know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So when you plant the seed of Buddha or Islam or what have you, you, you produce a false religion. If you plant the seed of John Calvin, which basically mm -hmm. eventually developed into Presbyterianism and some Baptists, etc., and you also plant the seed of Martin Luther, well, you're going you're to produce departures. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 in particular, talk about how that latter times some shall depart from the faith. Well, why did they depart from the faith? Because they gave heed to deceiving spirits, human people talking about things other than the true gospel and also doctrines of demons. Keep in mind that if it's not the doctrine of Christ, therefore it is doctrines of demons. So when we talk about the mission, sharing the whole gospel of the whole world and starting with your community, and we talk about the method of preaching the gospel and planting the true gospel seed, then we're talking about making sure that you plant the right religion, that is the true New Testament Christianity religion, and that you produce the right gospel in the right church, which of course is the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we could talk a little bit more about, you know, people who say, well, well, Shane, I am a Christian because I accepted my Jesus as my personal Savior. I believed on Him. I was saved at that point. I'm a Christian. But that's not what the Bible teaches. No, that's not what it teaches. And so, it's so very important, friend. That's why we need to know our Bibles so that we can plant the seed in a good and honest heart so that it will reap fruit and good and good fruit and so that's what we're doing with regards to the mission of the lord's church and the method that we're to employ and that is the one true gospel now what is the gospel well in first corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 paul talks about it being the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ but is that all that's employed in the gospel actually it's not in fact we find that for example in Romans chapter 6, very interesting, in Romans 6, we find the case in verse 17 and 18. This is part of the gospel where Paul says to them, he says, But God be thanked that though you are slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Isn't that part of the good news? To be in out of the enslavement of sin and being freed by the truth of the gospel? Certainly that's part of the gospel. And of course what Paul is referring to here when he talks about the form, the pattern, he's referring back to Romans 6, 3 and 4. Talking about, or know you not that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death because it's in bat water baptism where you contact the blood that washes away your sins. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the good news uh, and so what, what else do you want to say about the well, gospel? About the gospel in particular, what is the one true gospel? As was mentioned, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His shed blood, Ephesians 1, 7, Revelation mm -hmm. chapter 1, verse 5. It's the blood of Jesus. That is the one element that saves one sin. However, how do you get into the blood? That's called obeying the gospel in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. When Jesus Christ comes a second time, He comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. So the gospel is more than just the good news about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel also is how one gets into the cleansing blood of Jesus. And that's the reason why we go back to Mark 16, 15 to 16, where it says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then Shane, it tells us part of that gospel is he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you don't mm -hmm. preach that, if you don't teach that, 
then you're not given the one true seed, the one true gospel that produces the one true New Testament Christian and therefore forms the, the true New Testament church. Mm -hmm. and, and there's various verses we could point out, like Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, where it says this, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We could go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, where it talks about that we have redemption through his blood which is talking about that Christ paid the price on the cross for our sins. And that is, He shed His blood. And as we were just talking about, that it takes our faith to access God's grace and to obey God's commands so that we can receive the promises of God. We can receive the forgiveness of our sins. So, so that's why we talk about employing the true new gospel. And that is, we also need to remain a faithful Christian. We need to keep on keeping on. We can't give up. We must endure to the end. And in Revelation 2 verse 10 it talks about be faithful even until the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. And so we've been talking about the, you know, the mission of the Lord's church, David, and talking about the case that, okay, we're to go out into all the world and we're to share the gospel with others. We're to start planning congregations in uh, everywhere that in our wherever we're at, of course, right. in our community, and uh, we're to make disciples. We're to duplicate ourselves. Exactly. And uh, then we talk, talk about the method that that goes about doing, and that is we're to, of course, share the one true gospel. Exactly. And then we're to make sure it is the one true gospel. And one of the verses before we close out is Acts chapter eight, begin with verse thirty-five says, Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. So he started preaching the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Then watch, watch happens in verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now Shane, how did he, what made him bring up this idea of water baptism when he was just, it says, preaching Christ? Well, it evidently preaching Jesus involves water baptism. Exactly, exactly. And so we really hope that you have been ready and we're, we're, we're trying to make you ready for this and be prepared to help plant the New Testament church in your community and we hope that these videos will continue to help you please stay tuned for our, our next video where we're going to discuss different things and we're going to get to some practical concerns on how to go about doing this and then of course you can go to our website thegospelofchrist.com under study aids and look under manuals and you'll see how to start the church of Christ in your community thank you Bye.